There's something that The Last Jedi does significantly better than its two counterparts in The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker, and it has to do with the word intertextuality. Now, what does this word mean? In short, it's the shaping of one's text by another text. In the context of Star Wars, it's how the movies are shaped by its predecessors. Since the Star Wars sequel trilogy is indeed a sequel trilogy, intertextuality is inevitable. Now, it should be noted that intertextuality is not a good or bad thing. It's how it is used that matters. For example, in The Empire Strikes Back, it takes concepts and characters from A New Hope and expands upon them. Everything that was in A New Hope that was put in The Empire Strikes Back serves a narrative purpose and isn't just simple fan service. Now, if you look at the Disney Star Wars films, I would say that all of the films besides The Last Jedi could have handled these moments better for the most part. An example being from this scene in Rogue One. Ponda Baba and Dr. Everzon just show up for a brief few seconds. Now, I want you to ask yourself, what purpose does this serve? Well, the only purpose that this served was fanservice. Fanservice to get a cheap, unearned sense of nostalgia. Something similar could be said about the cameo of 3PO and R2 right before the Battle of Scarif. Now, since I used a bad example from Rogue One, it's only fair to provide a good example from Rogue One, where I think intertextuality was effective. For one, the whole concept of this story is a good example of intertextuality. It takes a line from the opening crawl of A New Hope and turns it into a story about self-sacrifice. Another example would be where Galen Erso tells Jin about the flaw in the Death Star. It takes a concept from the original movie that was kind of silly and uses it to give Galen Erso more depth as a character. Now, as much as I love the sequel trilogy, The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker are filled with these kinds of moments. Moments like Finn holding the training ball or the Starkiller base trench run, for example. These moments do not serve any narrative purpose. There's a reason why people criticize J.J. Abrams for just making remakes of original movies. Now, I've made a video why I feel The Force Awakens is more than just a remake, but it's little moments like these that just add to the illusion that J.J. Abrams is just ripping off the original trilogy. Now, as I said before, I feel these four films handle intertextuality rather poorly. It doesn't mean that each film doesn't have good moments of intertextuality, and it doesn't mean that they are bad movies. I think both The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker have many moments that are great examples of intertextuality. And just in case you are new to my channel, The Force Awakens is one of my favorite movies ever, and The Rise of Skywalker is a movie that I like very much. So I don't have a bias against these movies. But I feel it's The Last Jedi that handles intertextuality far better than the other Disney Star Wars films. There's many moments in The Last Jedi that I feel are good examples of intertextuality, but there are three scenes slash moments in particular that I want to focus on for this video. The first scene I want to discuss is Luke in the Millennium Falcon. Now this scene is full of nostalgic moments. Seeing Luke in the cockpit brings back memories from when he was younger. Talking to R2 brings back memories of his relationship with one of his closest friends, even though that friend is a droid. Seeing the hologram of Leia reminds us of the moment that started Luke's hero's journey all the way back in A New Hope. So yes, these are all moments that do serve as fan service. But it's not just fan service. All these little moments of this scene serve a larger purpose. Seeing Luke in the cockpit doesn't just serve the purpose of reminding us of the original trilogy, but it also shows us how much it hurts Luke that he is staying on this island, and how committed he is to his belief that he will bring more harm to the galaxy if he returns. The same thing can be said about the hologram of Leia. Again, it's to show how hard this decision is by Luke, and how much it hurts him, but it's a decision that he feels he has to make. The next scene that is an excellent example of intertextuality is the Force Ghost Yoda scene about halfway through the movie. A Force Ghost of Yoda appears and gives advice to Luke. Yes, this scene does serve as some fan service because Yoda is a fan favorite and just the silhouette of Yoda appearing was enough to draw cheers from the audience. But Yoda is there to serve a purpose. To remind Luke that failure is an important part of life that it's okay to make mistakes and how we don't need to be defined by those mistakes. Yoda's motivation is what helped Luke to sacrifice his life to save the galaxy. So again, this is another example of a nostalgic scene that serves far more than just fan service. 
The last scene I want to discuss is not really a scene, but a small moment that lasts maybe two seconds. It's seeing Luke's old X-Wing in the water. On the surface, it can just be another fan service moment. We remember Luke's X-Wing, so it's cool to see it again. But what's the context that this image tells us? It displays that this is a choice that Luke made and he wanted to be stuck on this island. It can also be symbolic of Luke's mental state. The X-Wing was destroyed and so is Luke. Yes, it was revealed in The Rise of Skywalker that the X-Wing was fine, but I do feel this was Ryan Johnson's initial intention. Now, I want to be clear with something. I don't think that effectively implementing intertextuality automatically makes the film better. At the end of the day, small fanservice moments are okay. I would be lying to you if I said that seeing R2 and 3PO show up in Rogue One didn't make me smile. In moderation, I feel fanservice can be really good. But when it's done too much, it can become a problem. And this has been a reoccurring issue in most of Disney's Star Wars. However, those who feel this is a big problem should still be looking forward to the future of Star Wars. I think The Mandalorian is an excellent example of intertextuality done right. I think Lucasfilm is finally learning how to effectively implement intertextuality after the conclusion of the sequel trilogy. But even though these new films have struggled with intertextuality, this is how The Last Jedi effectively uses nostalgia. Thank you for watching another one of my videos. I just wanted to say that stay tuned for a video on Saturday. It's not going to be a video essay, I will have a video essay on Sunday, but this video is going to be an announcement, and there's going to be a way that you guys can get involved in one of my videos. And besides that, I hope everyone enjoyed the video, unite the Claude Squad, and I'll see you guys next time.